Today, we welcome science historian, best-selling author, and one of the world's best-known skeptics, Dr. Michael Shermer, back to Skeptico. He's here to talk about his new book, Heavens on Earth, The Scientific Search for the Afterlife, Immortality, and Utopia. Dr. Shermer, it's always fun to talk to you. You are one of my favorite skeptic frenemies, and it's good to have you back. Right, here in uh, in a hotel room, as you can see, in uh, beautiful San Francisco. The lighting is really funky here. I should get a little, oh, that's better, a little, a little warm glow on my face. How's that? There, that's better. <laughs> Look great. You know, uh, you know, I was just thinking before, <clears throat> as I was kind of doing the introduction and stuff, I go, man, I, I wonder if there'll be another Michael Shermer. I mean, I think you captured a certain time and you found your own lane and you found a voice. I just wonder with, you know, things change. Uh, I wonder if that'll ever come again. Oh yeah, no, for sure. There's lots of uh, skeptics doing what I do. Um, you know, I, I never wanted to be cult of personality for skeptic magazine and skeptic society when I'm gone, you know, moving on to the great iCloud above where my connect dome will live forever. <laughs> Uh, but my physical body is gone. The Skeptic Magazine will continue. The Skeptic Society will continue. There, you know, there's, uh, you know, plenty of funding for, um, uh, you know, continuing the organization. It's not based on me at all, really. I'm the currently driving force. But, and then in terms of my books, you know, I just try to do what, you know, write about what I'm interested in that I think is, you know, relatively important. But um, there's certainly nothing uh, special about that. There's a lot of great science writers. I was just uh, at a book event last night with Leonard Maladnow, and you know he's one of the great science writers. Steve Pinker is one of my good friends, as is Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins. You know, a lot of people writing about science and reason and skepticism. So, I think it's a, a big movement now. And, and in fact, my latest column, I just that just came out in Scientific American, is on the rise of atheism. That there's a lot more atheists than uh, not not just the rise of the nuns, the people that tick the box for no religious affiliation. But um, because th those people may be going to be supporting Deepak Chopra or something, you know, just the, uh, you know, the new age movements or whatever, not necessarily becoming atheists. But, um, but I think a lot of them now are, uh, now that the rise of atheism, you know, we are a, a powerful uh, voting block. So I, I am just one voice among many, uh, uh, along with yourself. Well, that's, uh, no, no, I'm on the other side, but you're a, you're a humble guy. I appreciate, uh, I appreciate humility because I think you really have made more of an impact, but that's great, you know, and I'm so glad you're here. I talked with you a couple of years ago about your book, The Moral Arc, a book that I really liked. We had a good conversation on, but this time around, uh, your latest book is kind of much closer to the Skeptico Swing Zone Tell folks a little bit about what you set out to do with Heavens on Earth. Uh, well, it was sort of a, a, a part of it is an extension of my previous book, The Moral Arc, uh, talking about utopias, for example, the attempts to create a heaven on earth and, and why that always fails. But of course, that's not what um, most people believe. Most people believe that, um, that there's some place to go after the death of the body and brain. Um, that the mind or soul or, you know, some incorporeal, uh, ethereal essence that represents who we are moves on to some other place. So I just decided to take a swing at, uh, you know, looking at the uh, scientific aspects of that. You know, to what extent is that true? What is it that different religions claim? And so right off the bat, for example, there's a, a history to heaven. Uh, and this is not like, say, the history of cosmology, where there's a sense of a growing... Yeah, but I think heaven really takes us in another direction, which is, is a, a direction that you've covered and covered well in terms of religion. But, you know, I think what, it, it's kind of a tricky word when you get into heaven. I mean, what I really wanted to focus on, because like I say, this has been a, a topic of mine, an interest of mine. I've probably interviewed, have a hundred interviews with some of the top consciousness researchers, names oh, that yeah. you would recognize, near-death experience researchers. Yeah, yeah okay, and, all right, yeah, so, sure. I guess where we might start, where I thought we might start, because Heavens on Earth, one of the areas you get into is near-death experience, because I think when you look at science and you look at what's going on and what's made an impact in the culture, certainly this idea of, okay, does this consciousness thing survive bodily death has been one place where we can kind of put 
our attention and really answer that question. And I don't know, we need to dig into that. I don't know that you really did a very comprehensive job of looking at that research. And that's, really? I guess, that's the longest chapter in the book. <laughs> Uh, I'll tell you, uh, yeah, I have written about that before. I know all about the, the, the topic and I, I didn't want to know all on. about the topic. You think you're yeah. pretty well versed. Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah. That re reincarnation, anomalous experiences and so on. So the, the idea is that, uh, you know, most of us are dualistic by nature. So we have a, a feeling that, uh, there's something floating around up there beside, you know, that are thoughts that are not just our brain and chemicals and that, and that essence, that sense we have is what leads us to think that, you know, this floats off the brain and goes off into somewhere else. So the near-death experience then is alleged to be an example or evidence of how this can happen. And, but of course, we, you know, we have to start right off by pointing out that the, the people uh, are not actually dead. It's near death. It's called near death for a reason. They're not dead. They're, they're near death. And that's very different. That, that is your brain, your consciousness is still going uh, at some level, even if you're, you're, you're unconscious at the moment, there's still some part, part of your brain operating that generates these uh, experiences. So I talk about... That would be example, a good topic to get into because that's... And, and I want to go there because I think that's kind of misunderstood and misconstrued by a lot of people. We have a whole bunch of neuroscience that says these are the conditions under which a brain is able to function in terms of memory, in terms of conscious experience. So this idea yeah. of death, death versus near death, you know, we'll get into that in a minute. Certainly when someone yeah. is completely comatose from every measure we have, we don't believe there's any conscious experience going on. So I, I don't well, know. Like that. in the case of Eben Alexander, he's, he Let's said, talk about, hold up on Eben, because I want to talk about him later. But the first thing I wanted to hit you with is just that the first thing I did when I got the books, I went to the index and I said, okay, here are all the near-death experience researchers I've talked to. Are they in there? No, name after name after name, none of them are in there. You know, a couple of years ago, I interviewed Jan Holden from uh, the University of North Texas, who along with Bruce, Dr. Bruce Grayson from the University of Virginia, two of the most prominent names in near-death experience research, they compiled this book, The Handbook of Near-Death Experiences, mainly for people in the medical community so that when they encounter someone who comes up out of a cardiac arrest and said, hey, I had this incredible experience, they can be at least familiar with what to tell them. At the time they published this book, Michael, in 2009, they had over 100 peer-reviewed papers that they included in their book. By now, there's over 200 peer-reviewed papers. Okay, I, I don't think see any of that in your book. I think it's important we make it, well, look, yeah, I don't have to cite everybody that's ever written on the subject. But you don't uh, cite any of them. You don't cite, I mean, I do. oh, you yes, I Pin do. Von Lommel, Lommel, Sam Parnia, who else? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You misrepresented both of them, but you, yeah, you at least cited them. Happened. But at any rate, uh, let, let's back up for a second. And, and, and um, this and idea... I, I'd, I'd have to say, you know, Evan Alexander, I want to talk about him, but technically he's not a near-death experience researcher. He's a Harvard neurosurgeon that had a near-death experience and wrote brain. a book about it, right? Yeah, that's right. But he knows a lot about it. He knows as much as you do, as much as I do, because he. But he uh, hasn't published peer-reviewed papers on looking at the science. The peer-reviewed paper thing, is a, that's a red herring. I'm not denying that people have real experiences. You're, you're treating this as if the experiences represent some other dimension, a heaven, a place to go. And that is not at all what these uh, peer-reviewed papers indicate. All they say is that the people that have the experiences have very real experiences, which I agree. The experiences these people have are very real. The question is, is do they represent just neural activity or neural activity and something else. And I claim that none of the research I've read, none of the stories, none of the papers uh, are evidence of an afterlife. You, you do claim that. And, and Michael, look, you're a science guy and you love science, you report on science and you do a good job. And the other thing you do a good job on and has been one of your strong points with Christian apologists is you've called them on cherry picking, right? Say taking Bible scripture and cherry picking out pieces that they want in order to make their point. I got to say, I think that's what you've done here with the near-death experience research. And I'd give you just one example. 
so you're a medical historian. You're not a medical doctor, right? You don't claim to be a medical doctor. I'm not a medical historian. I'm just a historian of science. So, but, but go ahead and give me your best example of what you think I, I, represents I, not, not, not neural activity that produces a powerful experience. People can get that from ayahuasca, from ecstasy, from deep meditation, and so on. We know this. You can get it from brain stimulation. You can get it from oxygen deprivation. I, I, I mean, you think, seem to think it's something beyond that. Well, here's where I would focus on, is on the research, on the science. I don't think peer review is a red herring per se. I think when you look, it's the best means we have right now in science for policing science, finding out if people are doing good work. But again, what, 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 are you, well, what, what papers are you talking about? I'll, I'll get to that, okay? So I'd say you're not a doctor. So when we get into medical fields, I like to look at doctors. I like the near-death experience research from a guy named Jeff Long, radiation oncologist, right? So this is a guy who works with death and dying patients all the time. He also happens to be a near-death experience researcher, compiled the largest database of near-death experiences, analyzed it scientifically with a scientific survey, and here's what he says. I'll pull that up for you right now. So... I guess the question is, for the average person who's trying to sort through this idea of near-death experience science, research, how do they sort through it? How do they know what research really holds up out there? The key thing is to know a few of the consistently seen elements of near-death experience that are the strongest evidence for their reality. For example, when you're under general anesthesia, it should be impossible to have a lucid uh, organized remembrance at that time. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, under anesthesia, you're typically so far under with general anesthesia, they often have to breathe for you. I mean, you're literally brain shut down to the level of the brain stem. Um, and at that point in time, some people have a cardiac arrest, their heart stops. And of course, that's very well documented. Uh, they monitor people very carefully that are having general anesthesia. So I have dozens and dozens of near-death experiences that occurred under general anesthesia. And at this time, it should be, if you will, doubly impossible to have a conscious remembrance. And yet they do have near-death experiences at this time and they're typical near-death experiences. They have the same elements and appear to have them in the same order as near-death experiences occurring under all other circumstances. And in fact, a critical survey question I asked was what their level of consciousness and alertness during the experience was. Well, even under general anesthetics, under those powerful chemicals to produce sedation, if they had a near-death experience under general anesthesia, their level of consciousness and alertness was identical to near-death experiences occurring under all other circumstances. There's absolutely no way the skeptics can explain that away. It's impossible. Well, we have a skeptic here. Explain yeah, it well, away. Well, he's wrong. Uh, not every single one. 100%. He's wrong. Let's make sure we understand. He is a medical doctor. He is a full-time radiation oncologist. He works with people who are yeah, under anesthesia a, every day. But an he's wrong. Tell me. Tell me how your. Tell me how your expertise would lead you to believe that he's wrong about his medical understanding of the state of consciousness. There is a phenomenon of, of a small percentage of the population when under general anesthesia, they become aware of what's going on. It's a well terrible. known. Well known. I've interviewed an anesthesiologist more than one on this show. Right so there you go. That's it. That does so, not, that does not explain it. It's a well known yeah, phenomenon yeah. that, that they, they work again, around. Alex, you seem to be missing my point. It, it isn't denying that people have powerful neural experiences under different conditions, oxygen deprivation, sleep deprivation. They have these floating out-of-body experiences in the uh, James Winery's research with the pilots that are accelerated in centrifuges, stimulating um, a part of the temporal lobe during these epileptic... Great, you're really uh, making my points here. So surgery, go ahead. Uh, that you can, you can replicate all of the... Um, experiences that people report in NDEs through drugs, through conditions, through neural stimulation. Not true, but you're all still making, it, you're still all making. All of that shows that 100% of the experiences they have are neural related. They're, they're, they're related to the brain. Now, maybe you want to argue that 
you know, at some point, the consciousness lifts off the neurons and floats out into space. Is that what you're arguing? I'm arguing that I'm just going to repeat to you what Dr. Long told us. Don't repeat to me what Dr. Long says. Well, Tell me what you think. Do you think that the connectome or your memories or your thoughts float off of the brain, they're, they're, they're no longer connected to the neural tissue and go somewhere else. Is that what you think? I'm happy to answer that. And you can grill me with all the questions, but I did want to return to one thing. Cause I, I think. No, 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 come on, Alex, we're having a conversation. Tell me what you think happened. I, well, I on, think, let, me, let me close the window here. We're getting the. Uh, that's a great San Francisco sound. We got to have okay. that in there though. All right, all right. Go ahead. Yeah. So what do you think? What do you think happens? I, you know, you want to talk about red herring. I think that's a red herring because, again, you're a science guy. You know what? So we can falsify paradigms. We can falsify theories without substituting another theory. So I'm not sure how consciousness works. What I think the evidence strongly points to is that our current model of consciousness being 100% tied to neural activity doesn't fit. And that's where I'd return you to Dr. Long's statement, because I think there's some subtle points in there that folks who are hell-bent on dismissing near-death experience data miss. So do you remember the point where he says that not only are these people having this experience under general anesthesia, but their experience is consistent with other people that are having it under different medical well, of situations. Course, you know, brains are structured the same way with the same neural chemistry. But and Michael, course, Michael, let me just finish. Let me just finish my point because yeah, you're, you're really not. You're really not. Uh, I, I just you're just not quite correct there because what we know from neuroscience, what neuroscience tells us, it's the basics, is that different medical conditions, different uh, physiological conditions create different situations in the brain. Like you mentioned the They G-line. also produce similar experiences and not yes, all the But they shouldn't be Here's producing. An point. The people that describe heaven, they're different heavens. If they were actually going to a real place, the place should look the same, but it doesn't. It varies considerably. So how do you explain that, Mr. Non-Skeptic? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I, okay, can't, so if, I if, cannot. If, if, if you got me. If you go into an actual place, it should look the same. Why doesn't it look the same? You got me on that. I cannot explain that. Let me, let me, more, they don't see the same people. You know, Christians see Jesus, but others that are not Christians, they don't see Jesus. You got, uh, me, you, you got me on that, too. That's a, that's a question I don't have an answer for. Well, okay, so one answer is that do you want to? I want to. I want to yeah. get another researcher to the table because in your book, one of the points you make is okay. The transformative power of near-death experiences. I'm not denying that they're transformative, but that's not that's People. not what her clip says. What her clip right. speaks to specifically, specifically, this is right out of your book, which. It is you make the point that hey, people when they're resuscitated, they claim to have seen things that they shouldn't be able to see. Well, they've seen it on TV, they make it up. Here's a researcher who asked that question. With the control group, I had then patients who'd been successfully re- resuscitated, but they didn't have a near death experience or they didn't have the out of body component. And I asked them if they could describe what they thought that we had done to them. And, and they were like, what do you mean? I don't, I was dead. <laughs> I don't remember anything, right? Exactly. That's right. And they were saying, why are you asking me this? I have no idea what you did to me at all. I, and I, the majority of them couldn't even guess. They couldn't make a guess as to what we'd done. And then a few of them then did make a guess, and it was based on TV hospital dramas that they'd been watching. And what I found was that there were errors and misconceptions in what they thought we had done to them. And so some of them thought that they had been DC shocked with the paddles, and they hadn't. Those people had just had the resuscitation, the CPR, um, and drugs administered, such as adrenaline or noradrenaline. And then some of them made educated guesses, but the place where they thought that we put the paddles onto their body was completely erroneous. It was wrong. It was incorrect. So data, it, data, data. You know, this is great stuff. Yeah. So it just, you know, it just goes to show that the people who did re- report the, uh, the near-death experience 
described their experience with it with accuracy, whereas the control group weren't weren't accurate, and they most of them couldn't even hazard a guess. Okay, so first of all, full disclosure, you didn't know about that research. Uh, I know about similar research to this that. Uh, what are the objective criteria by which they decide whether a narrative account is a hit or a miss of what they did? That's How many details have to get correct for you to say, yes, that's accurate for what we were doing to you. No, you must have gotten that from a TV drama because that's not what we did to you. This is How many, basic, basic how many scientific. Points the narrative story? No, no, this is super, in science, you have to operationally- I'm glad you're back to science. Okay. She wrote and published a peer-reviewed paper. Well, I'm, I'm asking you, what, what, what was the criteria for deciding if a narrative was a hit or a miss? Well, the, the narrative was the survey that they did, which was a professional scientific survey, right? Do you understand? I mean, I don't want to sound condescending. Of course you understand that medical surveys are really the backbone of science. So if someone takes a medication, we go in and we ask them, how did you feel? You know, it's supposed to help you with pain. Is your pain reduced? How does this, oh, what is this sensation? So people were calling experiences and calling things are a part of it. So she did a You're professional. As if the person is floating up at the ceiling and looking down at the operating table or whatever right and that they're getting details beyond what somebody would from their imagination okay you surely know about the experiment where this has already been done where they set up platforms up by the ceiling with photographs facing up such that if somebody does this in an er right. looks you're up. referring to dr sam parnia who is a colleague and, this is never, and they've never had any hits okay uh, so why not but again you're misrepresenting that the research. more you the more you hone down and fine tune the objective the exact right, opposite is true the exact hit, opposite the effect disappears. it's just like with esp as sue blackmore point, uh, always pointed out uh, also with ndes the tighter you make the controls the weaker the effect gets i don't think that's true at all and as a matter of fact that's kind of my main point that i'm coming at you with is i just don't think you've fairly looked at the near-death experience research. Like you just referenced Dr. Sam Parnia, been on the show multiple times. Dr. Penny Sartori, been on the show multiple times. Skeptics of near-death experience science, interviewed many of them. Uh, uh, Sam Parnia and Dr. Penny Sartori, along with Dr. Peter Fennick, were a, a group that has researched together. They started out in the UK. Uh, all this different stuff. Dr. Sam Parnia is one of the leading experts in the world on resuscitation. So again, these are medical experts. Their conclusions matter. They matter more than someone just casually looking at it. So Dr. They, Parnia's they, conclusion is exactly consistent with Dr. Penny Sartori, Dr. Peter Fennick, Dr. That, Jeff Long. No. That Every near-death experience researcher has come to the same conclusion. Alex, what the data suggests about? that the consciousness survives the death. Have, no one's ever reported seeing one of the photographs accurately. Never. Not one. So what are you talking about? We can talk about the conclusions that the guy has from his research. And you have to be careful with this because, as we talked about before, and we can talk about again, you... You can't misrepresent someone's position. You can pick apart their research and say why you think it's wrong, but you can't say they're saying one thing when they're saying another. That, that, I can't take your book and say, oh. I don't know what you're talking about. Give me an example. I shall give you an example. Okay. You remember this one, right? Yeah. So Dr. Pin Von Lommel writes this paper. Michael Shermer, Scientific American, says, hey, this thing strikes a blow against... <laughs> yeah, in my opinion. No. You, yeah. you can't... You can't Alex, do this. The guy, when opinion, you have... When you write a science opinion. paper... It, it, when, I'm I sorry. Didn't you, you didn't write I a didn't science quote. paper. I'm, I'm, I let me correct quote him saying that he thinks that it supports the... Uh, that you know the modus position of of, uh, of of only brain and no mind. I didn't say that. I said that's my opinion. No, what you said is right up on the screen. Well, you said it. that this study delivers a blow to the yeah. idea that mind that's and brain could opinion. be separate. That's, when that's I read the study, like, I said it delivers a blow. Yeah, that's right. That that would be like me saying your book. Heavens and earth, heavens on earth, delivers a blow against the 
neurological model that consciousness is tied. You can do that. No, I would be, I could do that. I could do that. I could do that. But I would be misrepresenting your position. I I wouldn't be fair to my audience. If I told my audience, hey, Michael Shermer thinks that's not the case, but I think that's the case. That's one thing. But to say that, that his book W- without putting into context, delivers a poll. And, and the evidence of this is clear. I mean, you have Dr. Pin Van Lommel coming at you saying, hey, this is, uh, this is completely wrong. My research argues exactly the opposite. But I don't want to well, go... He, may, I wanna... he may argue for that, but I think his research points in the opposite direction. It does not point to consciousness beyond life. It points to powerful neurological experiences that people misrepresent as floating off into the ether somewhere. So let's get at that. Let's let, Tell me what you think, in your opinion, since you studied this extensively. When the person is up by the ceiling looking down, what is the medium or platform that holds the thoughts and memories, and, and how do you see something without a, without a visual apparatus, without a brain? How does an ethereal spirit see anything? Uh, again, and, and I, I repeat myself, but I really feel strongly about this, is that I don't think we have to to falsify the existing model of mind equals brain and we should never look beyond that is a huge step. And to take that step allows us to then begin to answer those questions. I don't think we have to have those questions answered in order to say, this is what the data is telling us. This is what the scientists are telling us. Alex, that's not what we're talking about. It's clear from this conversation and the books and papers you're showing me that you and these other researchers definitely think this is evidence of the continuation of consciousness, all right? So curious minds want to know, how does consciousness continue without a brain? But again, that's the question. That's the question we need a man on the moon effort to answer. But, you you know, the the one point that you'd make that that you kind of... No one knows, okay? Right, that's right. No one knows. It's a mystery. So but one thing that isn't a mystery point, that, that, that I think we can't misrepresent. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Neurological activity or it's neurological activity and something else. Okay. So I compiled a lot of evidence that, uh, it, it, and, I, and not just with the NDE, say in my chapter with Deepak Chopra, he thinks consciousness continues beyond death, not because it floats off the brain and is hovering somewhere else, but because consciousness is well, I'll use his words, the, the, the ontological primitive. It is the ground of all being. You can't get underneath consciousness. You can't drill into the atom down to strings or quarks and find consciousness. It is, in, in a sort of panpsychism way, it's everywhere. And so when your conscious mind lifts off the, the, the brain, it, it doesn't go anywhere. It's just, it's just still part of consciousness that's pervasive throughout the universe. So it's the same question with, with Deepak that I say to him, well, what's more likely that the research we have in neurology points to the brain, the mind equals the brain and nothing more, or the mind equals the brain and something more? And in my opinion, it, 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 the evidence points to just brain. In his opinion, it, there's enough to go in the other direction. Okay, so uh, we don't have a part of the problem you and I and everybody else has is we don't have a cogent theory of consciousness. We don't know how uh, brains produce what we're doing right now, that is experiencing life. And so without that theory of consciousness, we, we're not going to have a, a, a cogent theory of altered states of consciousness. So we have a collection of, uh, of accounts and experiments of unusual things that happen, not just NDEs. There's, there's many, many more unusual. I have a whole chapter on anomalous psychological experiences that people have, including my own. Uh, and, you know, I've written about, um, you know, the sense presence that people have, uh, alpine climbers and solo sailors and, and solo flyers and so on, where they sense a presence in the room. Very powerful. Okay, there's whole books on anomalous psychological experiences like Stanley Krippner studies. Um, I know all about this research. The question is, what does it represent? Well, we don't know for sure because we don't understand consciousness yet. So all we can do at this point and say, well, in my opinion, the lines of evidence all point to uh, no brain, no mind. But there's enough anomalous, weird things, and we don't have a good theory of consciousness that allows you and others to say, well, no, I think I'm going to... I think I'm going to say it can go this other way and that consciousness survives death. Okay, maybe. On that last part, I don't know that that's really the direction where things are going. You know, the last time we talked to you a couple of years ago, one of the guys you brought up on your team was 
uh, Dr. Christoph Koch, right? A guy yeah, I've spoken yeah. to, interviewed yeah. on this yeah. show. Hey, man, he's moved over. He switched well, jerseys, sort of, right? Not, not sort even of the moved pants over. Like uh, okay, sort of moved over. The position yeah. has shifted. These guys are no longer holding to the mind equals brain thing. You know, another clip I was going to play for you, but I played enough well, clips. You're well, very you, nice to do it. But even Deepak says you need a brain. Well, hold on. Sam, Sam I heard mind. I could play for you the clip of Sam Harris and David Chalmers, right? So Sam Harris, I don't think much of Sam Harris, but he's a name everybody knows. David Chalmers, one of the leading researchers in consciousness for a number of years, and they're there talking. They say, you know, uh, Dan Dennett, you know, the consciousness is an illusion. Come on, you don't really think he believes that, do you? I mean, we're not still stuck there, right? So this idea that you're putting forth this kind of militant uh, materialism, mind equals brain, we've moved past that. All the leading players have moved past that. Michael, that's just no, the state. They haven't. No, no, no. Well, Christoph just... Koch has moved past it. David Chalmers has moved past it. Sam Harris yeah. has moved past it. Who, who are you going to point to? No, Dan no, no. Dan I, know Sam. I know Sam quite well. He, he, he hasn't moved past anything. What are you talking about? He's... He's not a strict materialist. He's not a strict mind equals brain guy. No, he's totally in the uh, panpsychism, spirituality, something other than strict yeah, mind equals brain know. materialism. We did a public event together uh, in Austin that he's going to post in a, a week or two that you can listen to where, you know, he, uh, you know, we, we ask talk him, about bring him on. I'll have both you guys on at the same time and I'll invite the people to talk to you. But anyway, all right. So, um, Obviously, we're going to have to agree to disagree on, on this point. Uh, and it's not going to be resolved, you know, today. You know, it's a hard problem. And, you know, that's why Chalmers calls it the hard problem. I'm not sure. I've talked to Pinker about this. He's a good friend. Um, it, 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 Steve thinks it, it may not be a soluble problem because we're, we're phrasing it the wrong way. We're asking uh, science to do something it can't do in terms of, you know, what – First of all, what do you even mean by consciousness? Now, I, what Sam means, uh, I think, and most people would agree, is what it's like to be something, like what it's like to be a bat or what it's like to be a dolphin. Now, on stage, we kind of disagreed on, on the next point, which is, in my opinion, if to find out what it's like to be a dolphin, say, you know, I strapped on flippers and I put on some sonar equipment and I reprogram my brain to uh, process sonar instead of visual and, and or you know, whatever, instead of human apparatus and so on. And I just kept morphing a, a lot. I could hold my breath for 10 minutes and, 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 and so on and so on. At some point, I would just be a dolphin. And I wouldn't even be, I wouldn't even know that I was a human asking what it's like to be a dolphin. Now, now Sam disagrees with that. So I'm not sure actually what that means in terms of your pen. So I, I don't think it means that. But, but that what it's like to be something to, to get at that, you have to kind of be that. You know, what it's like to be a glass of water. You know, in Deepak Pan Psyche, you know, the, the glass of water is, is conscious. It's just very simple consciousness. Uh, and, you know, what it's like to be a dog. I can kind of envision what it's like to be a dog, uh, but it's hard to do because I'm so trapped in my own uh, human brain. All right, so... Um, you know, we've focused a lot on this extended consciousness and consciousness thing. What are some of the other key findings or, or points that you were trying to get across in the book, Heavens on Earth? Because you, you do have, it's, we did focus on a small part of it. What, what else do people need to know? Like even, even at the very beginning, I kind of pulled you off this thing of the history of heaven, which I, I think is an interesting point. Well, from the very beginning, we can't even imagine what it's like to be dead because to imagine something, you have to be alive and conscious. So it's like, imagine being under general anesthesia. You can't imagine because to imagine something, you have to be awake, all right? So unless you have this condition where uh, you, you wake up under anesthesia and you're aware, but you can't move and it's terrifying and all that. But I'm not talking about that. <clears throat> all it is is, you know, boom, boom, lights out. And then you wake up and you have no sense of how much time has gone and so on. It's just, you know, you can't, we don't have the words to describe it. Darkness, nothing, emptiness. And so, you know, to ask them, well, where do you go when, after, you know, after death? In, you know, the same place you were before you were born. You just don't exist. Well, I can't conceive of what that would be like. It's, it, it's literally inconceivable. So this sets up something of a paradox. I cannot conceive of not being alive, and yet I see death all around me. And the hundred billion people that lived and died before us are gone, and they've, they've never come back. 
short of the handful of near-death experience type things or the claims of resurrection of Jesus and things like that. Or in, in the case of, um, uh, you know, Hinduism, reincarnation, okay? So, I mean, you're focused on NDEs, but there's lots of other versions of this uh, that have nothing to do with that. And, and the people believe as strongly as you do, you know, that something continues after consciousness. Okay. In my book, I... I conclude that no one knows including me i don't know that there's no afterlife i don't know that you know when i close my eyes for the final time i won't wake up in some place and there's my friends carl sagan and christopher hitchens and stephen j gould and my parents and you know people that i have known and loved and, and are gone maybe they're going to be somewhere and I'm, I'm going to be there with them i'm good with that i think <laughs> um, i'm fond of I find I'm quoting Christopher Hitchens' description of the Christian heaven as celestial North Korea. You know, we, you have this dictator that knows all your thoughts and controls everything, and you're there to worship him, you know, the dear leader. That doesn't sound very heavenly to me. But, you know, his point is that what are we talking about when we're talking about the continuation off into someplace else? So this is not a light problem. Uh, you know, with Christian groups, for example, I said, well, w when I'm – when I die and I'm, I'm reborn, I'm, in, I'm a Christian, so I'm in heaven with Jesus. What's up there? Is it this physical body? And some of them go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Jesus was physically resurrected. The empty tomb. The tomb is empty, so his body, it's not just like it, 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 with your examples of NDE, consciousness lifts off the brain and floats off somewhere. No, for Christians, Jesus you know, left the tomb, the empty tomb. So the physical resurrection of the, of the whole body and brain is what goes to heaven. Uh, for, for some sex. Now, to that I say, well, how old am I then? Uh, and, well, you're 30, because that's the age Jesus was when he was crucified. He was 30. It's like, well, I'm 63 now. So what happened to the 33 years? <laughs> you know, that, doesn't that go with it? You know, all the memories and the scars and whatever else has happened to me. And they say, well, no, you'll be made whole again. You know, the blind shall see, the deaf shall hear, and the, you know, handicapped or whatever will be made whole again. And so here I quote my friend Julia Sweeney, the Saturday Night Live comedian, in her monologue, Letting Go of God, where the Mormon boys come to her, her house in Hollywood and knock on the door, and they're pitching their Mormon religion. You know, everybody gets a, a planet and so on. And, uh, and the, you know, the blind shall see and the deaf shall hear. And so on. She goes, well, I, I had uterine cancer, so I don't have my uterus anymore. Do I get my uterus back when I go to heaven? Mm. And you can imagine these 18-year-old boys in their starch white shirts going, Uterus? I don't know. Yeah, you get your uterus back. She goes, I don't want it back. <laughs> she goes, what if you had a nose job and you liked it? <laughs> so, I mean, uh, so there's all kinds of logistical issues here. What are we talking about when you're up there? Okay, maybe it's not the physical body. It's just your memories. Okay, but which memories? Because there's no such thing as a fixed you. Uh, your memories change throughout your life. They're like a wiki. They're edited constantly. And they're upgraded and changed depending on new circumstances. We know that we, we're biased and we back engineer into our uh, memories the consequences of what we did. And so we justify and rewrite our memories to justify our actions and so on. So all this happens in the course of a lifetime. There's no, like if we took a snapshot of your connectome, as it's called, the analog of your genome, and copied it and put it in the cloud, this is the scientific version of, of what we're talking about here that I write about. I call it the afterlife for atheists because this is what a lot of people are trying to do. Copy the connectome, which would presumably be all your memories, and float it off into, you know, store it in a computer, or put it in the cloud or something and turn it on. So first of all, which memories? Because that's just a snapshot of me at that particular moment. And then if it continues, those memories are going to keep changing. But, but worse is the point of view self. The point of view of me looking out through the world and experiencing life now, which is a continuation from day to day, interrupted by sleep and anesthesia or whatever, but, but there's a continuation. To turn it off, you know, copy it, turn it off, kill me, and then put the copy into the cloud, uh, I don't think my point of view self would go with it. Any more than if we say copied you, Alex, right now with the sophisticated fMRI brain scanner, copied your connectome and uploaded the digital file of all your memories into the cloud while you're still alive and you're still sitting there in your podcast room there, uh, alive and awake and fine, and we turn the copy on up in the cloud, your point of view self wouldn't suddenly leap there. You'd be still sitting there going, no, 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 this is me, Alex. That is the copy. 
Now, the copy is not you. It's just a copy. Now, the copy may think it's you when he's running a podcast from somewhere else, but it's not you. <clears throat> okay, so uh, all of this is uh, sort of the, a, a deeper philosophical problem, the problem of identity. You know, who are you? We know, for example, that our bodies are recycled every seven to ten years. You're not the same man you were a decade ago, as I'm, I'm sure your, your friends tell you. <laughs> okay, come on. That, that's funny. No, no, I... <laughs> <laughs> you you're funny. You're a good, you know one of the things that when I when I talk to people uh about Michael Shermer and I talk to people who are kind of on the other side of the camp, the friend of me kind of camp, you know, everybody likes you. You you're just you're just a good guy, you're a good guy to talk to. You're the other thing is you're a very open guy. You know, not a lot of people uh do these interviews. You probably forgot what the show is about, which is okay too. But you know, you are an open guy. You are a guy who's willing to get on stage with Deepak Chopra or whoever it is and hash these ideas out. And I think that's why what I was alluding to at the beginning is that I haven't seen anyone else do it quite like Shermer does it. And you think there's going to be other people that are going to step in there and do it, but I don't see him on the horizon. So I think it's pretty cool. Um, I'm not in agreement with heavens on earth, but I'm sure glad that you're out there doing what you do. You're in San Francisco. You're going full speed ahead, trying to communicate these ideas. You're on stage talking about it. What, what are you doing for this book? And then what are you doing? You know, what's you have another well, book I, I, as well, I, I, right? Book events, but actually I'm on stage with Deepak on Tuesday in New York City for the Intelligence Squared debate. I don't know when you're going to air this, but if uh, Tuesday, March uh, 27th, uh, it's live stream. People can watch it. The, the resolution is the more we evolve, the less we need God. Okay, so he's going to argue. I'm not sure what he's going to argue, but uh, I, I think <laughs> you know I think, what he's going to argue. You know, I remember a long time uh, listening to you, and I thought you had a great point, but you, it was kind of a, a a weary point about when you were doing the evolution thing with uh, Discovery, uh, what Discovery Institute. Oh yeah, yeah. You yeah. kind of said, look, after a while, you know, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to wheel out my stuff, and they're going to go out there and they're going to wheel out their stuff, and you know, it's kind of predictable, not a lot, of, but you said it in a way that is like. Truly, you know, almost like a, a a theater actor, a stage actor who has to do it still. You know, I mean, that person came to see Michael Shermer, to see that debate, to see that played out. And that's important, too. So it doesn't demean the fact that people might have heard both sides of this argument before. Right. Yeah. And so and again, I mean, we have to have some epistemic humility. You know, we don't even know what we don't know. And there's a lot we don't know. <laughs> that we don't even know we don't know about things like consciousness. So it's entirely possible that someone like Deepak or yourself or whoever, on, or, or, or Christians talking about the afterlife or, or Jews or Muslims, you know, there's lots and lots of different versions of this out there that I write about. Um, and, in, you know, I guess, you know, one of the, one of the appealing things about cryonics would be that, that you come back in a thousand years to see what people think then about consciousness, black holes, or, you know, whatever, you know, the science moves on. And, uh, you know, it's just hard to, like, we're like fish in the water. You know, we don't even know that the water is there. I don't, I don't know. Uh, you know, uh, this is why I like um, Steve Pinker's point about this question of consciousness, you know, the hard problem of consciousness. It, it, it may be that it's being phrased in a way that we'll never be able to answer it the way we're thinking about it, and that we need to think about it in some completely different way. And that may be the case. You know, there's a group of people called the Mysterians. Uh, Martin Gardner was one of these. That, you know, there, there's certain mysteries that it's not just that we haven't solved them yet and we just have to, you know, improve our technologies of experiments or whatever. It's that they're insoluble. And free, like Sam, Sam Harrison, I disagree on free will. He's a, he's a strict determinist. I'm a compatibilist. I agree we live in a determined universe, but that we're part of the causal net and we can tweak it and change it volitionally. Uh, but at some point, we just run into a brick wall of words. You know, what do you mean by determined? What do you mean by free or volitional or, or compatibilist or whatever? And uh, like, for example, I say, I said to Sam, "What's it, you know?" So we have a we have a, a an opioid addiction crisis in the country now. You know, it, it appears that there are some people that really cannot control themselves. They just go down a path, and they can't stop, and they overdose. Uh, now, I don't have this problem. I know people that are alcoholics. My father was an alcoholic. I can have a couple drinks and stop. He couldn't. I know people that cannot stop. 
Now, what's the, if, if we all live in a determined universe and we're all determined, what's the difference between that guy who can't stop and me who can stop? That he's more determined and I'm less determined? I mean, what, you know, there, this is why Dan Dennett calls this degrees of freedom. You know, there's certain amounts of things you can control or can't control depending on a lot of different factors. So, but at some point, I'm a, I told this to Sam and Sam says, no, 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 it, it, you're, you're still determined. You're just determined in a different way. Okay, maybe, you know, but what, do, so what do we mean by that word determined? You know, so, and we're kind of, this is what the point Wittgenstein made that we're, we're restricted by the words we use because we have concepts the only way for me and you to share our concepts is to talk and use words. And the words have certain meanings. And maybe you mean something slightly different than what I mean. So we have to operationally define the words we're using. So when we measure it and I look at it and point and you point at it and look, we're, we're talking about the same thing. That's not always easy to do in science. And I think consciousness is especially difficult uh, problem. Anyway, so that's, that's my piece there. Good. It's a good piece. So again, folks, the name of the book is Heavens on Earth, The Scientific Search for the Afterlife, Immortality, and Utopia. Our guest has been the one and only Dr. Michael Shermer. Thank you so much for joining me. I really do appreciate yeah, it. Man. Keep up the good work. <laughs> You're the skeptic skeptic. <laughs> Somebody's got to do it. Hey, somebody, you know, it's like the fact checker. Somebody's got to fact check the fact checkers. <laughs> the, the Dr. Seuss who's watching the watchers, right? right. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, buddy. Right. Thank you again. Take care. Yep, be good.